Hey, welcome to the Hell Has an Exit podcast. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 888-699-9395 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com. Hey, and welcome to this special two-part episode, The True Story of Marty Tankleff. If you missed part one, please go back and listen to it. It's episode 51. This week is the continuation of this story, part two. Marty has an amazing story of escaping a crazy hell. Accused and sentenced for a crime he did not commit, for which he served over 6,000 days in prison. So here we go with part two of Marty Tankleff. Now, I have to backtrack to 1993 because it's important. In 1993, a woman by the name of Carlene Kovacs came forward to us and gave us a statement which we ended up turning over to the DA's office. She said, I was at a party where Joseph Creedon... If you remember, Joseph Creeding was one of Todd Stroman's henchmen. Mm-hmm. And Joseph Creeding confessed that he was the murderer of Marty's parents. This is 1993. Mm-hmm. We gave that information to the DA's office in 1993. And they did, did nothing. Okay? So you think about this, 1993, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. Finally, 99, 2000, we started uncovering some new evidence. Now, when someone submits that evidence, is that evidence always there forever? They just can't bring it into court so you guys can can look at it? So every state has a very weird procedural issue. So if you bring a post-conviction motion and you raise an issue, in some jurisdictions, you can't bring that same issue up again. Thankfully, in my case, we were able to bring up all the issues. Now, mm-hmm. also forgot to mention, McCready, who is the lead detective, was being interviewed by a reporter who, and during that interview, he disclosed, which was the first time we ever heard this, that Jerry Sturman had hired Hell's Angels bikers to commit violent acts in the past. So now you think about this. That, I mean, obviously that's something we should have known at trial. We should have known that Jerry Sturman, whose son was a drug dealer. Has a connection to the Hell's Angels. Hired, at least, it didn't even matter if it was the Hell's Angels or not. So it was the fact of, Hiring somebody to, to commit violent acts. Yeah. And once again, that information was brought to the DA's office. They did nothing with it. Mm-hmm. So finally, around 99, 2000, I hired a private investigator who said, if you're innocent, hire me. If not, don't. How are you funding this? So thankfully, in 1994, 95, when Steve Braga got on the case, they did the case on pro bono. And that is because a young woman who in many ways is a lifesaver, Laura Teichman, was a girl I went to high school with. Wow. And she wrote a paper about my case for her law school class. Holy shit. And she was interning. At a law firm. At a law firm in Washington, D.C. called Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin. And she pitched this case because. She knew you. She knew me. She also knew that the lawyers who were representing me, which was Mark Pomeranz, and when they stopped representing me, the firm was Rogers and Wells. If anybody knows who Rogers and Wells is, is that when the space shuttle exploded, God knows how many years ago, it was the Rogers Commission. Mm-hmm. And that firm had expended almost a million dollars working on my appeals because there was no cost that mattered to them. They believed in me. They wanted to work on my case. But after... You're saying that... the them working on your case cost them a million dollars. million dollars, yes. And it was at that point where they said, listen, Marty, we can't continue representing you. We'll help you find out the lawyers. We'll do whatever we can. Steve Braga came on. Uh, it was Steve Braga, Barry Pollock, and Kirsten Levingston back then. And Steve, who was like the pro bono chair, went to the firm and said, listen, this is a great case. We'll litigate the case. Maybe a year or two, we'll get Marty home. That was like 95 Steve continued to represent me till I got out of prison in 2007. It's crazy. No matter what firm he went to, he, he continued, continued to with my case. And so did Barry Pollock. And so did a lot of the other lawyers. I mean. What is their motive? Doing the right thing. 
Um, Crazy. Every lawyer will tell you if they have an opportunity to work on a wrongful conviction case in their life, do it because it's the one thing that's rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about it, there. There was one of the lawyers that worked on my case. His name is Roberto Gonzalez. I think it was like 24, 25. And he worked on the DNA motion because during my post-conviction proceedings, we actually applied to the judge to have DNA testing done and the judge denied it, mm. which to me is insanity. I think anywhere in America, if a defendant is asking for DNA testing, just do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, prosecutors and DA's offices use it all the time to convict people. And if you're a defendant saying, I'm willing to do the DNA testing, I'm willing to accept the test results, just do it. The judge denied it. So Roberto did the DNA motion and he was so good at it that the judges afterwards said, would you be willing to come back and lecture us on it? Mm. But when I got exonerated and released from prison, he was a young lawyer who'd been involved in a wrongful conviction case. He wasn't somebody who'd been practicing for 20 or 30 years, like Bruce Barquette. He or, just had experience in wrongful conviction. No, no. He just, what happened was, is that a lot of the young lawyers, Dawn, Courtney, Celia, Roberto, they got involved in my case. They all got invited out to a lunch by one of the partners and said, hey, come on, let's go out to lunch. And it became common knowledge that if one of the partners that were involved in the Tankliff case invited you out to lunch, you knew that was because you were being recruited or asked to work on the Tankliff case. Uh -huh. And there wasn't a single attorney at any of the firms. And I had, you know, Miller Cassidy, LaRocca and Lewin, Wilmer Hale, Ropes and Gray, Clifford Chance, Rogers and Wells, Bruce Barquette and his team. I've had, you know, some of the nation's best lawyers who worked on my case and there wasn't a single attorney that ever said no. Mm. And if you ask every one of them, you know, what is, you know, the, the most proud moment of their life, they'll say birth of their children, marriage and working on a wrongful conviction case. And for some of my lawyers, you know, the fact that I've become a lawyer is really just amazing for them. Yeah. And, you know, one of their bucket list is, okay, Marty, we want you to be co-counsel on a case mm -hmm. with us. So we can say, you know, you went from client to colleague to co-counsel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, very different, but I have, uh, you know, a drug and alcohol rehab that I run. And I have seen client go from alumni client to uh, employee to therapist. So, you know, it's cool when you get to see that full circle it's it's very rare though. Like you know, if, if you look at America, Tina was telling me that you're one of six. It's probably now it's less than ten, I think, in America of of wrongful convicted exonerees that become attorneys. Become attorneys. Wow. I think I'm the only one. You got to be the youngest. No. No. Okay. No, there are some youngers. Okay. I'm the only one in America who can say that they're an exoneree, a lawyer an adjunct professor at Georgetown, and an adjunct professor at Torah Law School. Wow. So I have, you know, I have dual professorships mm -hmm. and an attorney. I'm the only one. I think I'm probably the only exoneree who can say that he is currently representing people in New York, Ohio, Texas, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Wow. Uh, and has been... You took the bar at all those? No, no. Uh, so, but I'm co-counsel. Okay. So the one, the one thing is in some of those cases that I'm allowed to do certain things as a non-attorney out there. Okay. Um, but what I can do is, is that I can get admitted what's called pro hack vice, which is by permission. But I'm also admitted in federal courts in the Eastern District of New York, the Southern District of New York, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and the D.C. Federal Court in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. When I took the bar, it was called the UBE. So you have a, I think it's up to 280, 285. I scored a 277. You scored so, a 277? Seven. And with that score, wow. I think I can get admitted in every jurisdiction that takes UBE, but I think Alaska, I think Alaska requires a 280. <laughs> in Alaska? I think, I, think it, wow. I think Alaska was a 280. There was one jurisdiction that was like a 280. I'm like, okay, so I can't get admitted there. Okay. So if I want to get admitted in, in a UBE jurisdiction, I've got the UBE score. I may mm -hmm. just have to comply with some local rules. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that with my experience, co-counseling with local counsel does a lot better because they, they're they on the ground there. They know the courts. They But I bring in a very unique perspective and, yeah. and whole dimension. Yeah, yeah. You know, they say, uh, like, you know, what comes from the heart reaches the heart. And I think that... Um, you know, in my case, there's a lot of times where there are people that are deemed unreachable and, you know, recovering addicts like myself can go in there and 
reach someone that everyone else is kind of like gone. Well, if you ever want me to come and speak at, you know, your, yeah, yeah. your pl clinic, please let me do because yeah, I be think, cool. you know, what I've been able to impart on a lot of people is that there is a way out. Uh -huh. And it's one of the things that, that my, we're jumping ahead, Yeah. but Mark Howard, uh, Mark Howard is my childhood friend who decided to go to law school to fight to get me out of prison. Wow. He, cause he was a tenured professor at Georgetown. And as you a have tenured, a childhood friend that dedicated his life to law to help so, get you out of prison. Well, here's the craziest thing. So I can't even get my friends to, to hang out with me so, on the weekends. So Mark actually wrote the first publication at the purple parrot. Uh huh articulating that I was innocent. And I, I think he deserves a Pulitzer Prize or whatever yeah. prize he can get because he was the only publication that got it right. You know, we, we joke about this, but this is serious. We always say that Mark went to Yale and Marty went to jail. And that there's truth to that because he did go to Yale and I did go to jail. Yeah, He used to always tell people, listen, I've got this friend who's innocent in prison. People are like, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. <laughs> but he always used to talk about that. Mark, after, you know, getting his PhD, ended up becoming a professor at Georgetown, and we reconnected, and he came to visit me in prison, and he said, I'm never going to stop fighting for you. Before he was a lawyer, he actually reached out to about 60 of my high school classmates to see if they would sign a, a friend of the court, an okay. amicus brief. Okay. And about 60 people signed the brief. Mark wrote it. It was filed with the court, and it was considered part of the appeal. Hmm. And Mark had, was accepted into Georgetown Law School, and he was scheduled to start right after I got out. But he, we didn't know I was getting out at that point. Yeah, yeah. He decided to go to law school. Mark was a tenured professor of government. And when he got involved with me, his whole curriculum changed. He started the Prisons and Justice Initiative at Georgetown. Mm. He goes into prisons now and teaches uh, college-bearing classes. He started the Frederick Douglass Project two weeks ago uh, because I recently joined uh, the Frederick Douglass Project as one of the board members. We did a virtual prison visit, and most of the prisoners had heard about me, never met me, and it wasn't until the very end that I said, you know, Mark, I said, I have to thank you for coming to the prison that day and making a promise never to give up because you've given me more and more opportunities. And all of a sudden, one of the guys finally put two and two together. He goes, oh my God, Marty, you're Neo. You're Neo. You're the one. <laughs> and I kind of said, oh my God, I guess I am. And, and Mark said, he goes, you know, he goes, the Frederick Douglass Project, the prison would never be in existence if not for Marty mm -hmm. and not for me getting involved. And Mark and I have gone on to, we co-teach a class at Georgetown. So from the time I got out, Mark would invite me down to Georgetown. I'd either go down there personally and speak uh -huh. to his classes or do, back then it was Skype. Yeah. We started thinking about teaching a class together. And I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy. It was 2018. I got out in, 20, I got out in 2007. I'm like, Marty being an adjunct professor at Georgetown, like they're never going to prove this. You know, and the idea was to use undergraduate students to reinvestigate real cases of potential wrongful convictions and have them create social media platforms and short documentaries and websites. Mm -hmm. And as it would be, we actually had a high school classmate of ours, Cindy Dorfman. They were based in DC and they heard about what we were doing. And we go out to lunch in the tombs and we all said, let's do it. So Mark pitched the idea of me becoming an adjunct professor at Georgetown, teaching this class with having Rob and Cindy and Travis filming it. Mm -hmm. and that's what we did. 2018, we taught this wow, class at Georgetown cool. and we worked on five cases. And within a few months of the class being over with, Valentina Dixon mm -hmm. was exonerated in New York State after serving 27 years in prison. Wow. And the three students who worked on this case, two, they were all exchange students. One came from France, England, and Japan. Ellie and Julie, the two young women, came from England and mm -hmm. France. They flew back for the day Valentino got out. And ever since 2018, Mark and I have continued to teach the class. We've helped get uh, Keith Washington out recently in Maryland. Uh, and the Keith Washington is crazy because the the main witness against him has recently just been indicted for the perjury hmm. that put Keith in prison. Awesome. So Mark and I and Steve Braga are now representing Keith in that. Oh, Steve Braga is still practicing Steve law? Steve Braga is still practicing law, yes.
and getting exonerees. <laughs> yes. Getting wrongful so Steve, over. Steve Braga is now with the law firm Bracewell. Who is this guy? Uh, Steve Braga is the bomb. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you know, he's been involved in my case. He's been involved in John Huffington's. He's mm-hmm. been involved in the West Memphis Three case. And, you know, he will tell you that it is one of the most rewarding work he's ever done. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, you know, we regularly have him as a guest speaker at our Georgetown classes. Uh-huh. Mark and I were also recently involved in the exoneration of Eric Riddick, who was in prison in Philadelphia for 29 and a half years. And we have a few others that are in the, in the in works, the pipeline. in the yeah, pipeline. That's cool. Every semester, you know, our students do this amazing job. You know, we always have to remind people they're undergraduate students, hmm. okay, that reinvestigate cases. They create social media platforms. Yeah, because when I did John Huffington, he was telling me that these are students that are working his case. It's so, so cool. So in most cases, most when you hear about these wrongful convictions, it's most of them are law students. Yeah, yeah. You know, we always have to remind, you know, the media, the experts that come in, they're undergraduate students because they're like, and, and the craziest thing is that, you know, some people say, oh, you know, what can undergraduate students do? When we start teaching this class, like- Well, like you said, it's common sense. <laughs> it's exactly what they do. They yeah. approach these cases using common sense. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say they're jaded, but I think they're naive about some of the corruption. And we just guide them and we empower them and we educate them. And they have done some of the most amazing work Mm-hmm. And, and the students walk away and say, you know, it's the best class we've ever taken. We've had people at Georgetown said it's the most impactful class that's taught at Georgetown because it has a direct impact on someone's life. Mm-hmm. I mean, our students have the ability to give someone their life back. Yeah. I mean, you know, Valentino, Keith, and Eric, you know, have told the students, like, you're my family. Like, no matter where we go in life, you wow. you, you were part of yeah. help me get my freedom out. I mean, the day Keith Washington got out, I drove down to Maryland. I was standing outside the prison gates waiting for him. Mm-hmm. I went back to his house, you know, and his wife and Keith said, listen, Mario, if we find out you're in the neighborhood and you don't stop by or you need a place to <laughs> crash, like, we're going to be really upset with you. I'm like, yeah. okay, fair enough. I was in Philadelphia recently mm-hmm. at an event for a, a case, and I texted Eric Riddick. He goes, you're in Philly. I'm coming to see you. Mm-hmm. And it's just the bond that we've developed with the, the people we've worked on. Yeah, um, And you guys have this, like, it's so interesting to me because, you know, being a recovering addict, like we have conventions and we support each other and we get people clean and those people get clean and they start helping other people. And like my desire to help other addicts is is from like this thing where like when someone pulls you out of this this hole, you know, like the guy who sponsored me till today, I, th- I feel like this guy saved my life. Like he found me totally, you know, tore up from the floor up, you know, and he took time out of his day with no other motivation other than I can't leave unless I help this person and someone did it to him and it's like this pay it forward type of drive that uh surpasses anything else that I've ever seen you know it really is I mean most I want to say most I said a lot of exonerees feel inertia or this desire to pay it forward somehow Mm -hmm. Um, there are some exonerees that just want to kind of go on living living life and and, and be quiet and there's recovering addicts do the same thing they they don't it's fine. I mean, yeah. you know, there are some that are some are very vocal. You know, I remember when I was before I was admitted as a lawyer. I remember as a paralegal, I had to go into a prison, mm-hmm. and I remember one of my lawyers said to me, <laughs> Bruce Barcat. <laughs> he just looked at me with like this tough, sternly look. He's yeah, like scared. He's like, just get the fuck over it, Marty. He's mm-hmm. like, if you want to become a lawyer, he's like, get over it. He's like, you got to do it, and like, you got to understand, Bruce. It, it, it was like there was that. That fatherly, but there with that strong emotion, mm-hmm. like confront it. Like it was like confront the fear. And it reminds me of when I was in law school, <laughs> is this is gonna blow your mind, mm-hmm. that I had to take a criminal law class. It's just one major problem. The professor was a judge, but before he was a judge, he was the assistant district attorney from Suffolk County that fought to keep me in prison in the appeals unit of the DA's office. And it was one of those moments I kind of said, What do I do? Like I need to take this class, but I have history with this guy. This guy fought to keep me in prison. Like, how do I do this? Like, and it was uh, one of those things, like I spoke to a lot of my lawyers and they're like, listen, Marty, you want to become a lawyer? You may have to appear before him, confront him. And I remember confronting him and I said, judge. You talked to him after class? No, this was before I even enrolled in the class. Wow. I said, judge, I said, you and I have history. Like, 
Did he even know who you were? Oh, he knew. They all okay. know. They, everybody, everybody in Suffolk County and law enforcement knows know. him. But he especially because he fought to keep me in prison yeah. as, as an ADA. And I said, listen, judges, you and I have a history that's unlike any other student in here. I'm like, is that going to affect our relationship? Is that going to affect my grades? And he stuck out his hand. He goes, no, Marty, because I welcome you in the class. And I thought he was one of the best professors at Toro. Wow. Uh, we've stayed in contact since then. Um, Has he ever said any type of apology? Not really? No, but I've had enough interactions with him. Where you don't think he did it purposely or Correct. he didn't know that you're innocent. He wasn't paid or anything like that. He just made a judgment call. And no, it. I think he worked for an office that said, this, this is, is your job. Doing. Do this. And a lot of law professor Toro said, listen, Marty, the, the judge is not the ADA that puts you in prison. The judge mm-hmm. is somebody different. Yeah. Anybody in my position, like everybody said, like, Marty, were you crazy? Like you were taking his class. Like he could have just destroyed you. Mm-hmm. And I confronted fate head on. Cause I'm like, you know what? You know, Bruce is right. Like there's going to come a day where I may have to appear before him. Yeah. And as weird as it was, is before I was admitted, I didn't have to appear before him, but I appeared on cases mm-hmm. with my law partner, Steve, where I like, I was in chambers with him. And yeah, you know, I, I still remember there was a case where an individual was facing like 25 years and there was a plea offer on the table and i said your honor permission to speak in chambers he goes yeah and i said listen your honor i said i think if we can you know talk the guy down to like six years instead of ten i can talk to him because i think he can do six Mm -hmm. and i remember that months later at the toro graduation the judge came up to me and he said you know what because i have to appreciate he goes you know you were the only one in that room that really had the balls the balls and the right to speak on that exact issue yeah okay because it's really hard for people to be making calls about how long you need to go to prison when you've never done any prison time. Exactly. I mean, all these, lawyers, kinda, were, all these yeah. lawyers were like, well, you know, he deserves 20, in this case is five, in this case. And it's like, really? I mean, the, the client ended up getting a lot less. Like, I think he ended up getting probation, yeah. no time in jail. But at that very moment when he was facing 25 years, mm-hmm. like, here are all these lawyers saying this is what he could do, this is what he should get. And the judge was like, listen to Marty. Yeah. But we still stay in touch since then. I mean, and that's the weird thing. So let's go back to the story. So you're in prison. I think we're at the point where you've been in, I think it's like 1999, 2000. And I hired a private investigator who yeah, yeah. did what would never have been done before, investigation, right? So we started looking who, benefited, my, who benefited financially from my conviction. Yeah. Stuerman, my father's business partner. Mm-hmm. Okay. Jerry Stuerman's son, Todd, drug dealer. Drug dealers have criminal associates, so let's start there. The private investigator went out, found an individual by the name of Glenn Harris. I think Glenn Harris was in prison at that time, and Glenn Harris said, I've been waiting for this day for like 13 years. Holy shit. And he said, why? He goes, I was the getaway driver that night. And that just opened Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. Glenn Harris identified Joseph Creedon. This is the private investigator found him. Yes. Private investigator found him because he did what no one else had done there. Nobody had really done an investigation, right? So the getaway driver identifies Joseph Creedon. Now, if you remember, Joseph Creedon was one of Todd Stewart's enforcers, Mm -hmm. but he was also the person who confessed to Carleen Kovacs in 1993. Did anyone have that evidence at this time? Did anyone find that? We had that in 93. We actually gave that evidence to the DA's office. Oh, you guys have it. We and had it. And we gave it to the DA's in 93. Nothing ever happened to nothing it. Nothing ever happened to it, right? So now all of a sudden we have the getaway driver who goes, yes, Joseph Creeding was involved. So that started the identification of Peter Kent as one of the other murderers. We also had other witnesses come forward who said, Jerry Stuman tried to hire me to commit the murder, but I passed it off on to someone else. Wow. And we had a number of witnesses. We had we had a, a businessman testify during public hearings. But that should be it. Wait, wait till I tell you who the final witness was uh-huh. in the hearing. And when you hear who the final witness was, that should be it, right? We had a priest and a nun testify that Glenn Harris confessed to them in prison of his involvement and who was involved. With his... Okay. Yes. He, he, okay. He, yeah. Okay. No, but he's okay. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, a priest and nuns allowed to do this? We had a businessman said wow. that he was doing work at one of Jerry Sturman's stores, and Jerry said, <laughs> don't fuck with you. I've killed people before. We had some of my family members. We had my original lawyer. 
We even had some people from law enforcement and some of their confidential witnesses Mm -hmm. testify. But there's a problem. So the ADA, assistant district attorney, that was fighting to keep me in prison at that very moment, his name was Lenny Leto. Mm -hmm. We had a witness who came to us and said, I've got this exculpatory information. Jerry Stumer tried to hire me. I didn't want to do it. Okay. And I gave it to so-and-so. He goes, there's just one problem when this witness came to us. He goes, I'm facing 25 years in Suffolk for a new arrest. So my lawyer was like, listen, we can't help you. Lo and behold, when he finally comes to court, Lenny Leto hires the son of a sitting federal judge, Mm -hmm. okay, who shares office space with the judge who's hearing my hearing, his father, okay? When that witness came to us and said, well, he couldn't hire a lawyer, okay? We asked him, how did you hire this lawyer? His lawyer's name is William Wexler. Mm-hmm. William Wexler is the son of a federal judge. He was like best friends with Lenny Leto. Like, well, how did you hire William Wexler? I just did. Lo and behold, the charges that were lodged against them, because when he came into court, he said, I lied to Marty's lawyers, okay? Lo and behold, We later found out all the charges were dismissed against him. And when the attorney general got involved and started reinvestigating my case, he admitted to them that what he told us was originally truthful Hmm. and he was fearful of getting 25 years. Wow. But on St. Patrick's Day of 2007, after we had 18 months of hearing, the judge issued the decision. The final witness in the hearing, though, was in January of that year, it was Joseph Creedon's son. Joseph Creedon's son said his father confessed to him of his involvement. Uh, so I think a common sense approach would think, oh my God, after 18 months, like number of witnesses, now we have Joseph Creedon's son coming into court saying, I was recently with my father and I asked my father about this and he admitted it. He confessed to him. Now, nobody would come to court and testify this if this wasn't truthful. I mean, I know at one point, you know, Lenny Leto said, oh, people are trying to get their five minutes of fame. Not Who the hell wants to get five minutes of fame later. in a double homicide case? Yeah. Right? Just, it's it just insanity, right? And how many years later <clears throat> is this? Years later. I mean, we're talking about the hearings started in 2005. Mm-hmm. That's when the, the first day the hearings were in 2005. And they didn't end until 2007. Tragically, on St. Patrick's Day of 2007, Judge Stephen Braslow issued the decision against me, ruling against me. And he said, you know, Mr. Tankliff brought forward a cavalcade of nefarious scoundrels. Well, you can imagine that the, the nefarious scoundrels included the priest, the nun, the businessman, my family. were not happy being grouped into that. So they held a big press conference afterwards. But at that point, you know, we had p- filed four separate applications before Braslow. Mm-hmm. One of them was a main application, which was arguing my innocence. One was arguing that a special prosecutor should have been appointed because Tom Spoda, who was the DA, had represented McCready, the lead detective in my case, in private practice, and also represented the Stewarmans when he was in private practice. We also filed a DNA motion, which the judge denied. And we also filed a motion based on a change in the law in New York on depraved indifference. Now, remember those lawyers from Rogers and Wells that had to disappear because they'd spent almost a million dollars? Well, guess what they did? They came back representing me pro bono wow. on that issue because they believed in me so much. So now when, when Brazel denied all of those motions, we had to actually ask permission mm-hmm. to appeal to the appellate division, which was the same court that denied me by 3-2 in... 1993, 1993, long period of time. Thankfully, they granted leave to appeal. We filed the briefs, and my lawyers made the arguments in September of 2007. And I remember that period of time up until the decision day as probably one of the worst periods of my life because, you know, I knew that the decision would take a few weeks. But, like, all of a sudden December comes around. Every day I'm calling up because I'm in Comstock Correctional Facility. Mm -hmm a.k.a. Gladiator School. And I remember every day calling home. Is there a decision? And my gut was telling me that, like, I didn't want to call home because every decision i ever gotten wasn't good news. This would be different, though. And I remember it was Friday, December 21st. 
it was literally the last day that they were announcing decisions of the year. Mm-hmm. And I remember calling home and I spoke to, I think it was Roz, who was, who was working on my case. And she's like, we won. Now, here's the issue. I had several appeals. What did we win? Mm-hmm. I don't know. So here I am thinking like, okay, what did I win? Did I win the DNA? Not a big deal. The stress of that point was just unimaginable Wow! because what you won, I, you know, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. And finally I got through to Bruce Barquette's office and I spoke to the receptionist, Lenska, who said to me, don't tell Bruce I told you, but you won the big one. <laughs> wow. It was one of those moments where I was like, oh God, thank you, right? And then when I when I spoke to Bruce, he's like, you won. He's like, they granted a new trial. He's like, and then like, oh my God. Like, it was still hard to imagine. I, and I remember him, he's like, listen, pack your shit. You'll never see the inside of a prison cell again. Oh my and God. And I was like, at this point, I was like, Bruce, listen, I know enough law. It's an oral <laughs> agreement. I'm holding you to it. It's binding. And I remember literally probably with within a half hour to an hour of me Getting making that phone call from the the whole jail knew. Wow. Because it was it made all of the news. Steve Braga, who was the lead lawyer who did the oral argument on that case, uh-huh. was on a vacation and he made it a point to schedule a legal phone call with me. Mm-hmm. And then he told me, he's like, Marty, he goes, You're never gonna believe this. He goes, like, before I went on this trip, he goes, I had a dream that this was gonna happen and it was gonna happen on this day. I'm like, what? And I remember, like, literally the whole jail knew. Like, everywhere I went, congratulations, mm-hmm. congratulations. And I remember going back to the cell block. I think it was after the legal phone call or at some point, And I was standing next to my friend Lou. And one of the officers said, he's like, you know, do you want to lock in? I'm like, what do you mean lock in? Like, aren't you afraid somebody's going to do something to you? And Lou said to him, he goes, they got to go through me and everyone else around here first. Mm-hmm. The guards were like, oh, my God. And... I remember thinking like, okay, you know what? Like nothing's gone quickly here. Like how am I going to get down? Like what's going to happen? And I ended up finding out that Bruce Barquette spoke to the ADA Lado and said, listen, we want to get Marty down here. Can, you know, can we make it happen quickly? And he's like, ah, it may take a few months. And Bruce said, well, you know, if I speak to the sheriff and I get a court order, can, you know, you do care. It's like, it's like do what you want. Mm-hmm. Bruce ended up speaking to the sheriff. He said, listen, you get me a quarter. I'll get Marty down in 24 to 48 hours. Bruce got a court order and I was produced and I was brought down on December 26th to the Suffolk County Jail and on obviously not much sleep that night. Yeah. But it was very weird. Like I have moments on the on the car ride home, not even home, uh, because I didn't know if I was getting released. I remember from Comstock leaving the jail and one of the officers took my prison ID card. He's like, I'm going to sell this on eBay one day. Like, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know what the hell eBay was. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, the two officers kind of just, they were nice. Okay. And I was like, okay, what's going on? Is this real? And I remember just, like, taking in all the sights along the way, like, the trees and the animals and the smells and just little things. Mm-hmm. We get down to the county jail and there's press everywhere. I walk in, I get processed in, and still not believing it's real. Like, it, it's still like, when you get out, you're out, right? So the following day, I get brought over to court. You know, the courtroom was packed. My lawyers were there. And I was freed. Mm-hmm. But the weirdest thing was I remember hearing the judge say, you're free on a million dollars bail. And then the court officer put the handcuffs back on me and, like, took me back into custody. And I'm going, what the hell's going on here? I'm like, didn't they just say it was free? Yeah. And I didn't know this at that moment, but generally you had to go back to the jail to get processed out of the jail and released that way. But since I yeah, had no- They don't just like let you leave out no, the courthouse. No, but, but since I had no property and really nothing, Bruce thankfully had enough relationships with the court officer in the jail that he said, listen, cause let's just process Marty out on paper and let him get released from like court officers. And I remember leaving the court officers like bullpen area and going out like this garage door. And I remember hearing helicopters off above and there was just crowds of people. And my lawyers were surrounding me, and they're like, we got to go back into the courthouse. And I remember looking at them like, you, I don't want to go back like, there ever again. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, I just got released in there. Why? And they're like, listen, you got to do a short press conference. 
But the biggest thing I remember was is that they were walking so fast. Or at least I thought they were walking yeah. fast. And I was like, can you slow down? Like, Marty, are you okay? I'm like, it's my first episode as a free man. Like, you want to kind, kind of enjoy, enjoy it. The, like, yeah. I, I kind of want to just feel this, right? Like, kind yeah. of enjoy it. I remember going back into the courthouse. And there's actually a funny end to this because, you know, I didn't know this, but everybody had to put their phones on silent. Mm -hmm. And they had some bodyguards there to kind of protect me and the family. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden when the press conference was over, the two bodyguards swept me away, brought me into a car, and nobody turned their cell phones back on. So here it was, I was out on a million dollars bail, okay? And nobody could find me. Yeah. Literally moments after I just got out of jail, nobody could find yeah, me. I was like, where the hell is he? Okay. And finally, they returned their cell phones on, and I met up with my family. I said to them, I said, on the way home, I want to stop off this one gas station, get a cup of coffee and a bagel. Like, what? And I go, throughout the post-conviction proceedings, the sheriffs used to stop at this gas station, get me a coffee and a bagel. They were nice. Yeah. And I said, this would be the final time I'd ever stop you and get a coffee and a bagel. And it has been. I've never gone back to that <laughs> gas station. But it was one of those defining moments that I'm like, I made it. Like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would be the end of it. Like, I thought I'm out. Um, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. There was still a lot more fighting to go. Yeah, because you still had to go to trial, right? So this was, I got on December 27th. And it was... How many years in prison was that in total? 6,338 days. So not that I was counting. <laughs> um, it was about 17 and a half years. Okay. But I remember a few days later, the state had announced that they were opening an investigation into the conduct of the Suffolk County DA's office mm -hmm. of my case. Back then, Tom Spoda had announced that he was dismissing the indictments against me. But my next court date was like, January 18th. Okay. And this was like maybe January 4th or 5th that he made the announcement. Every day, Bruce was saying, something's up, something's up, because he said, why do we have to wait to the 18th to go to court? Like, just let's go now. Like, any ADA can go into court and say, dismissal. Mm -hmm. I was out to dinner with family and friends in the city, and I got a phone call from Bruce. He's like, there's Hang bad on. news. What's it like getting out? Like, I need to know, like, what you went to go do, uh, what it was like to have like your friends around you, uh, what it was like, like seeing technology for the first time. So getting out was, you got to step back and just kind of slowly process all the little things, right? First time, like I'm back in a car, like a normal car using a cell phone. Okay. Cause when I went to prison, a cell phone was like this big, huge box with a battery. Mm -hmm. And here's somebody who's handing me this little thing. And like, I was talking on the phone Mark Howard flew back from France. Your my, best friend. My friend, best friend flew back from France for this. My family brought me back to my family's house and they had it catered from like one of my favorite restaurants when I went to prison. They were still around, so they catered the food. I had family and friends there. There was press there. I remember somebody got me a flip phone, okay, and uh, my phone number, and I still have that number to this day. <laughs> and somebody, the day within hours of me getting out, they set up an email for me. And I still have the same email. <laughs> and I remember somebody said, we're going to show you how technology works. I'm like, what? What are you going to show me? Like, we're going to send an email to like Australia and watch how quickly, right? <laughs> and literally it was like 30, I'm like, what? Like, how is it even possible, right? And You didn't know how email worked? Not really. We didn't have <laughs> access to it. I mean, here it was. Like, I would think like you hear about it or something. You, you, you hear about it, but to experience it in person, right? Listen, I, I yeah. used to hear about like, Great restaurants are opening up in the city, and I give family and friends like recommendations to go to restaurants. They used to laugh at me about that because I used to have this philosophy that I was never living in prison, I was only temporarily residing there. And since I was only temporarily residing there, like I would read up on restaurants and technology and, and just do things that people thought were very weird of me. So I'm like, I'm not going to die in this jail. Yeah, you envisioned yourself being out constantly, constantly envisioned myself what I was going to do. And I remember 1993, okay, this was before my first appeal was denied. My friend Eric was my next door neighbor, mm -hmm. clean correctional facility, I think lower age block, tier three, I think we were cell seven and eight. I was seven, I think he was eight. And I remember this so clearly. He's like, so what are we going to do when we get out? And he's like, we're both getting out. Now, he was at that point facing 25 years to life. He was serving 25 oh, years to life. For a murder that somebody else did, uh -huh. 
He was present for it. The guy who did the murder made a deal, so he testified against Eric and the other person. He gets the deal. He gets eight to third to twenty five. This is your neighbor. This was my neighbor. What? Okay. What type of neighborhood you grew up in? No, no. This was my neighbor in prison. <laughs> no, in prison. He was in. I was like, no. I was like, oh, no. neighborhood's fucked up. No, this is my your prison cell- neighbor. Your s- he was in cell eight. S- I was yeah. in cell seven. Okay. And he's like, I'm gonna get prison out. Neighbor. He's yeah, like, yeah. I'm gonna get out. I'm gonna become an artist. He's like, I'm gonna live on the Upper West Side. Mm-hmm. I said, Well, I'm gonna get out. I'm gonna, you know, become a lawyer. Wow. In 1993, you were going to become a, a lawyer. We bo- I mean, listen, I was serving 50 years to life. He was serving 25. Wow. We both had visions of what our future was going to be. Well, so important to what do, do you think happened to him? He's an artist. His conviction got reversed. Okay. He had almost 10 years in. They said, well, you could go back to trial or you could accept a plea bargain of 5 to 15. He's like, I've got almost five to, you know, I've got almost in. He took it. He's living in the Upper West Side. He's an artist, okay? And, you know, when we, the first time we got to lunch after I got out and Mm -hmm. everything, we were like, oh, my God, like, this is going to manifest itself into reality. Yeah. You know, I remember little things. Like, I remember, like, I was being interviewed by Rosanna Scotto in New York City. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were talking about, oh, you know, people, randomly people come up to me and say things to me. And also we go out on the street, that happened. And then all of a sudden I said, Rosanna, I said, why are these people talking to themselves? Like, are they crazy? Like, didn't I leave all the crazies behind? She's like, no, they're on their phone. I'm like, what do you mean they're on their phone? She's like, they're on Bluetooth. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's nothing in their hands. She's like, in the ear. I'm like, oh God. Like, that was like yeah. some early exposure. But I remember like that first day, like having a drink and everybody was like, be careful, Marty. You know, you haven't had real alcohol. I'm like, yeah, I know. I haven't had real alcohol. <laughs> like, and then just real foods and just a lot of the adjustments, okay? But, you know, what helped was my, my family had a house in Pennsylvania and we were able to deceive the press, mm-hmm. which is a funny story, where literally my family goes out the front door, we wave goodbye to everybody because the f- press yeah. is like, they're like glued to watch me. Wow. I go out the back door through the woods to a parking lot. My family picks me up. We leave out of state, uh-huh. right? I remember the the first day we were up there, I think it was, I don't know, it was like 28th or 29th. Mm-hmm. Woke up before everyone else. It was snowing outside. I remember I made a cup of coffee, I'm like in Long John's, and I'm sitting outside. It's probably 20, 25 degrees, having a cup of coffee, watching the sunrise and seeing it snow and just going, holy shit, I made it. Like I survived. Like I'm out of prison. Like I survived. And, you know, some of my family started to wake up and like, why is he outside? And, like just long, isn't it cold? You know, I don't know if it was the adrenaline or just the euphoria that that felt that I'm here. I am sitting. I made myself a cup of coffee. I'm watching the sunrise. Mm-hmm. There's no prison bars. I'm free. Like, is this real? Right. And, and, it's like and, in Shawshank Redemption when he goes to Mexico. It really is. And 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 you know, and you think like mm-hmm. in my head, I'm thinking like, okay, that, that's going to be it, right? And then all of a sudden, like a week or two later, I get this bombshell. Like the indictments aren't getting dismissed. Okay. The governor, who was Elliot Spitzer back then, mm-hmm. had appointed a special prosecutor to investigate in the case. So we honestly believe through conversations we've had with people that Spoda didn't want to dismiss the indictments against him, that he begged Spitzer to appoint a special prosecutor to remove the case from him. Mm-hmm. And that's what they did. They, the special prosecutor took over. They investigated the case for six months. They so for found- six months, you don't really have this freedom. Because it's kind of like, you probably don't even think it's really real. I knew it was real because I had enrolled at Hofstra University. So like three weeks after I'm out, I'm, I'm a student at Hofstra. <laughs> and I, I wanted to finish my bachelor's degree. Wow. Um, and that was a challenge in and of itself because the, you know, the press wrote some horrible articles. They found like one student who said, well, I don't want Marty on campus. He's a convicted murderer. I mean, the majority of the students were like, no, he, you know, he, the, the conviction was thrown out. He's more than welcome here. Yeah. But I remember every class I chose, I chose the seat closest to the door. Because mm-hmm. I said, I'm a goldfish in a sea of sharks. I'm never going to survive this. I didn't want to take my jacket off. You know, I, I'm around people who grew up on technology. I'm, you know, 37 years old. These, they're 18, Kids. 19, 20. Mm-hmm. Like, how am I going to survive this? And lo and behold, I became more accustomed. 
Okay. I never, I never really talked about who I was. I mean, I figured people, some people knew who I was. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden one day I'm out having lunch with one of my stu- friends over there. And she goes, do you think you get me an interview with Barry Sheck? And I looked at her and I go, why, why could I? She goes, oh, I know who you are, Marty. She goes, I'm cool with it. She goes, I believe in you. My whole family does. Wow. I was like, oh, okay. But like one of the best moments was, I know we're jumping ahead. Mm-hmm. So I'll backtrack. So here I was, I was a college student, but I had double murder indictments over my head. Never knowing what the next step was is because the convictions at that point weren't completely thrown out. They were just, I was granted new trials. There was a body of evidence and we had a feeling that the attorney general would uncover more evidence, which they did. They uncovered forensic evidence that had been withheld. They were in the possession of Suffolk County police the whole time. They uncovered other witnesses. They also tried to fabricate incriminating evidence against me by trying to convince people I was in prison with to testify falsely against me. Wow. Thankfully, none of those people did. Mm -hmm. And the indictments were dismissed that summer. And I remember when, so the decision to dismiss the indictments came out, I was driving from Albany back home I, my phone was just blowing up, but I was just starting to drive. Like, I didn't want to answer the phone. And finally, I said, man, it's like 30 phone calls. Like, what the hell happened? Mm-hmm. I finally pulled over. They're like, it's over with, Mari. The case is over. The indictments are dismissed. Done. Wow. So it was like, it was like one of those moments like, whew. Like, like, okay, is it really real now? Is it really real? From that moment forward, like, I really haven't turned back. And mm-hmm. like, one of the best moments was is that, at the end of 2008, I wanted to do a semester abroad in Venice, Italy. Needed a passport. There was just one problem. The passport agency still had it down that I had a criminal conviction. And I remember somebody involved in my case said, amazing, Marty. You know, a year ago, we were trying to get you out of prison, serving 50 years to life. This year, we're trying to get you out of the country. Mm-hmm. What a difference a year makes. Yeah. And I remember going to Venice, Italy and wow. having the time of my life. So cool. Uh, I mean, literally like- Do you walk- still feel like a kid? Yeah. I-, I tell people that, you know, even though I just turned 50, I said, you got to take 17 years away mm-hmm. from me. And that's kind of my real age, right? And th- the reason why I feel like I'm, I'm still a kid is I missed out on so much stuff growing up. That's how I feel. Um, and I think people don't understand. Like when I talk about like, I want to go ride a go-kart or- mm-hmm. I want to go to this restaurant or I want to go to this arcade. They look at me like, you're 50. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) Or like, you know, why are you Mm -hmm. hanging out with your students? Or why are you going to dinner with your students? I'm like, they're cool people. They're educated, have great conversations. It makes me feel young. You know, it's all these things. But, you know, you think about this, right? You take away 18 years of someone's life, the the, the prime of their life from 19 to almost 40. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, your whole natural maturation stops. I mean, you know, I remember when I was going to law school, I used to say I'm a failure. I'm like, here I am. I don't have any career. I've got no savings. I got no job. And my wife said to me, she's like, listen, Mari, she goes, have the same conversation 10 years from now. Yeah. Okay. And I remember like all of a sudden, like I was in a lawyer, my civil rights cases settled. Mm -hmm. I was an adjunct professor at Georgetown. I remember I was at a legal event where Bruce, one of my lawyers, was there. And it was Mm -hmm. a bunch of his partners and other lawyers. And they said, let's go around this circle. Like, what do you do? And they were like, okay, I'm a lawyer. Lawyer, lawyer. What do you do, Marty? Well, I'm a lawyer and a professor at Georgetown. They go, and how many of you served almost 18 years in prison? Think about that, Marty. And he's like, (laughs) stop. He's like, think about this. He's like, you've been out almost just about 10 years. Yeah. Because in 10 years, you get your bachelor degree, a law degree. He goes, you're an adjunct professor at Georgetown, Georgetown University, like one of the preeminent institutions in America, okay, in 10 years. Yeah. He goes, guarantee you, he goes, in the next few years, you'll be able to say you're doing better than the people who put you in prison or fought to keep you in prison. Guess what? He's right. Yeah. McCready, lead detective, dead. Okay. How did he die? Cancer, I think. Okay. Leto, the prosecutor who fought to keep me in prison, died while he was swimming. Wow. Joseph Creedon, one of the murderers, dead. Peter so weird, Kent, I want to clap. Peter Kent, dead. Wow. The chief of police who was working with Spoda mm-hmm. went to prison himself for four years. Spoda just went to prison. Hmm. Okay. Braslow should understand the judge who ruled against me. That's a cavalcade of nefarious scoundrels because those are men 
who were evil, who put me in prison and kept, and fought, fought to keep me there for almost 20 years. Those are nefarious scoundrels. Mm -hmm. Not the witnesses who testified in my case. Of course. When did you sue the state? Shortly after everything was reversed, we filed a, this is another crazy story. So I have to backtrack for mm -hmm. one second, then I'll go to that story. So as soon as I got, I, I jumped on board helping the Innocence Project out. And in two- you Got out of law school? Got out of, no, just got out of jail. Even before wow. law school, I was still yeah. helping out the Innocence Project. And one of the things that I did was I testified before, back then, it was Senator Eric Schneiderman mm -hmm. and Assemblyman Michael Gianaris uh, in Harlem. It was myself and Yusuf Salam. We testified. And I remember that day, Eric Schneiderman said, you know, I apologize on behalf of all of New Yorkers for your wrongful conviction. And thereafter, he actually wrote a letter for my admission to law school where he articulated his belief in me. A few years later, I was getting ready to finish up law school. And my court of claims case was getting ready for trial. I would have had to have either settled my case, go to trial, or my final year of law school. Mm -hmm. Eric Schneiderman happened to be the attorney general at that very moment. Wow. And we kind of said, Eric, do you remember the letter you wrote, Marty? Okay, this doesn't have to go to trial. So the state settled. I was actually able to finish my last year of law school. But who do you think the commencement speaker was at my law school graduation? Eric Schneiderman. Hmm. the attorney general of New York. And I remember, you know, when you go across the stage, he was the, I was the only person he hugged. Wow. And he said, congratulations. <laughs> and when I got off the stage, some people were like, how, how do you know, know him? Guy? Yeah, how yeah. do you know him? Like, it's a little weird. Uh -huh. I also had a federal civil rights case that settled years later um, through mediation. So I've settled a state court of claims and a federal civil rights claim. But there's no amount of money you can give me or any other exonerate that can ever make up for mm -hmm. what was taken from us. 1,000%. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, you know, look how much money he got. So I say, okay, let me ask you a question. I said, if you were sent to prison for 50 years and you survived 20 of them and you got out after 20, mm -hmm. would you take $25 million right now? They're like, hell no. I go, And not just that. There was no guarantee of you getting out, you know? So it's not no. like hey, you're going to do 17 years. It's like every waking moment, it's like you have no idea. I used to tell people the best time of day was night when I was sleeping because it was the escape from reality. I said the worst morning was waking up to hell, and that hell was waking up and seeing prison bars mm -hmm. uh, and, and realizing that I'm in a cage, and guess what? I'm locked in this cage until a prison guard opens up that cage. You know, I used to do things very weird. There were times I'd put my headphones on and face the inner wall and kind of try to distract myself from er the whole world. I would read the New York Times and mm -hmm. law journals and magazines because I said to myself, I don't want to, I don't live here. I reside here. I'm going to get out one day. Yeah, yeah. And after I got out, I went, like I said, I went from, finished my bachelor's degree at Hofstra, went to Torah Law School, had some obstacles getting admitted to the bar in New York. I would imagine. Not for the reasons you think, though. Mm -hmm. um, if I told you that the chief of the character fitness committee, his father was a Suffolk County police commissioner, and this individual was involved in my case in 1988 hmm. and involved in getting one of the witnesses disbarred. There was some history there. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, it all worked out. And what worked out was great was the day I was sworn in, Ronaldo Rivera who was the presiding judge that heard my appeal at Freeman in 2007, was on the panel that swore me in. Hmm. So here it was. My case was argued in the Appellate Division Second Department in 2007. And in 2020, I got to physically walk into that courtroom and get sworn in by judges that freed me. And what made the day even more amazing was that there were court officers that were there who said, Marty, I was here in 2007 when your case was argued. And to be able to be here today to see you getting sworn in before the same court that freed mm -hmm. you is just amazing. It's amazing. So cool. It's, it really was an amazing day for me because, you know, I, I've remained friends with some of the judges. I mean, yeah. Judge Krausman, who is one of the lead and vocal advocates on my panel, I'm, I, I still stay in touch with him. Mm -hmm. And one person, which, which I have to mention, which 
Remember the name Guido Calabresi? Guido Calabresi was the judge who ruled against me in the Second Circuit. The fifth judge. Uh, no, no. He was the federal judge. Okay. There was only three judges. He's the one that wrote gotcha. the opinion that remanded for the Batson hearing. So when I was at Hofstra, Roberto Gonzalez was one of my lawyers, mm-hmm. and I knew he'd clerked for Guido Calabresi. And I said to Roberto, you know, I'd love to go to law school. You know, Yale or Harvard would be great. And unbeknownst to me, Roberto reached out to Guido. Guido ruled against me. Mm-hmm. Guido's decision kept me in prison. The response was, I'd like Marty to come up to New Haven, and I'd like to meet him. Mm. Now, think about this. I, you know, here I am, like, Guido Calabresi is this leader in in the legal world. He was a former dean of Yale Law School, you know, federal judge on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and he wants me to meet him. I went up there, met him, and the first thing he did was ask for my forgiveness for wow. ruling against me. Wow. And That's ever so since cool. then, we're on a first name basis. Guido wrote a letter for me to be admitted to law school. Guido was one of my character references for getting admitted to the bar. Mm -hmm. And he is still, you know, he's not really a rabbi, but it's just, to me, you know, and anybody hears the story and reads his letter, it's kind of like, wait a minute, this guy ruled against Marty. Yeah. Wrote a decision that kept him in prison, but they're on a first name basis and they're friends. I go, yep, that's me. It's crazy. It's. I want to go back to, you know, because like, yeah, I understand that the money can never make up for it. But there are so many people that don't get anything. And that's something that I've argued consistently. I've said Mm -hmm. society has two huge failures when it comes to wrongful convictions, right? One is we don't have a system where we have like uh, corporations and companies making donations to create welcome home packages, right? Because I remember when I got home, you know, most people don't even think about everyday things you need. Underwear, socks, toothpaste, toothbrushes, clothing. Toiletries. And at least you had like family. Some people don't have that. Don't have that, right? But even that, why should my family, my friends be, why should it be their burden? I mean, listen, they've been fighting me for all these years when it was society, right? Mm-hmm. But I've said Yeah, this, that's the least they can do is have some right. type of welcome home package. So, so you're telling me that in America, okay, when you're only talking about 100 to 175, 180 Innocent people coming home each year. There's 180 people that come home innocent? Possibly. I mean, I think the other a few years ago it was 176, right? Wow. That number should scare your listeners for one simple fact. Translates that one innocent person is being released every two to three days in America, which translates that the guilty parties have remained free to commit additional crimes to victimize their communities. Mm-hmm. Insane. It is, but you know we can do better, right? Mm-hmm. You know it's you know the corporations in America, right? How difficult would it be for Amazon or American Express or Nike to give a gift card, like 150 gift cards, right? Mm-hmm. And put together a gift package that when somebody exonerate comes home, say, here, here's a gift package, right? Mm-hmm. I think that there should be a standard, some kind of settlement structure, not even a settlement structure, but a compensation structure. That should exist almost automatically because the one thing people don't understand is that you can be exonerated in federal court. I mean, exonerated from a criminal court. But then when you sue, and many times you have to reprove your innocence. So it's like you're being victimized all over again, Mm -hmm. having to prove something again. That was already proven proven and cost money and time and energy. And some people probably never want to be in a courtroom ever again. Be deposed? I mean – for me, I actually sat in the same room for the depositions as How McCready. long was the court hearing, you know, the process of you suing, suing the state? So, I mean, it was about 10 years. Mm-hmm. It was about 10 years. That's I, insane. Insane. That's insane. It's insane for one simple fact. If somebody gets out of prison, doesn't have a skill, doesn't have family, doesn't mm-hmm. have friends, what is he supposed to do? Yeah. You know, if you're guilty... The state does more for you. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to help you find housing. They give you a bus ticket. If you're innocent and you don't have family or friends, you're dumped on the side. You know, unless you have good lawyers or a good organization, that's why we as a society can do more, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've said this time and time again. If the billionaires of the world gave one quarter of 1% of their net worth put into a fund, Mm -hmm. okay, you can call it the exoneree fund, right? where we could 
take that money, invest it, and we could take the, the proceeds off those investments and give each exoneree who gets out something to start their lives up. Mm-hmm. We'd be a much better society. Yeah. Okay. Because we these exonerees wouldn't have to worry about suing and possibly going back to court and litigating. If Amazon gave a thousand dollar gift card to every exoneree, what does that really cost Amazon? Knowing that Jeff Bezos is what the world's richest yeah. man. I mean, think about this, right? You know, you're talking about toothpaste. You're not talking about luxury items. You're not talking about homes. I mean, listen, Elon Musk. Yes, I think you should give every exoneree a Tesla. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, think about it. What I mean, what would 150 Teslas cost Elon Musk, mm-hmm. na- knowing the worth of Tesla? Nothing. But you know, think about college loans, right? Think about people who have college loans that built up over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, when the state has kidnapped us, threw us in a cage for 18 years, there are certain basic things you could do to help the reacclimation to society. Okay, forcing me to take out student loans and pay those student loans back. Horrible. Mm -hmm. Okay, because when people don't understand, right, when you apply for a job or a credit card, you have no credit history. You have no history. I remember the first time I went in there. Yeah, of course. I have no history, right? And I remember the first time I got a debit credit card. I thought it was a credit card. I didn't know what the hell it was. I remember (laughs) using it as a credit card. I'm like, "Eh, yeah. So the bank says, you've overdrafted. I'm like, what do you mean I've overdrafted? I'm like, it's a credit card. Like, no, it's a credit debit card. I'm like, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that we don't have, like a reentry education program. Yeah. Okay. Because you think about somebody who's been locked up thirty years. You think they know about four hundred one k's and digital and, and digital crypto. keys and, yeah. and crypto? I don't even know about <laughs> cryptocurrency really yet. Okay. You know, just all of these little things mm-hmm. that, and I always tell people, we're not talking about thousands of people. We're really not. We're talking about maybe a hundred to one hundred fifty people on average, per year, Yeah. right? You don't think Nike can donate 150 or 300 pairs of sneakers? Yeah. Come on. And you know, thankfully, I've been able to get on my feet. I've actually helped people. But it's there are things I still promote every day because I believe in it. Mm-hmm. You know, some people say, well, you know, you had family and friends. You're right, I did, Yeah. which was lucky for me, right? I said, but I still had friends who took me clothes shopping. They bought clothing for me. I had lawyers that I knew, some not that worked on my case. They mm-hmm. gave me small donations because they wanted to do something for yeah. me, but they couldn't understand what to do. I mean, there, there were funny stories. Like I remember Bruce Barquette, we went out to lunch right after I started working with him and we went to a restaurant and I ordered duck tacos, mango iced tea, and truffle fries. <laughs> and he just looked at me. He goes, are you sure you were in prison? I go, what do you mean? He goes, what happened to just burger and fries? He's like, how do you know about duck tacos and, and, and truffle aioli and, <laughs> and, and mango iced tea? I go, I've been reading up about this, right? <laughs> That's funny. Getting out of prison and the reacclimation of society mm-hmm. was a very long process. And anybody who thinks it's not is a fool. You know, if you think about if you've been locked up for 30 years, what has taken place in 30 years? You know, I've always yeah, asked my crazy. students about this. I go, think about everything technologically wise, food wise. Culturally. Culturally, what's in your lifetime? Mm-hmm. Now, imagine putting somebody in a cage and keeping them away for all that, okay? I remember like, you know, I went from a flip flown to a Blackberry. Mm-hmm. And I remember speaking at Professor Saul Klassen's class and he saw that I had a Blackberry and he had a flip phone. He goes, wait a minute. He goes, why is Marty more technologically advanced? Mm-hmm. And he's only been out a few weeks. He goes, and I still have a flip phone. Mm-hmm. It made him get a it made him get a BlackBerry, right? I knew that unless I forced myself to get acclimated and force myself to learn things, I would be that goldfish swimming in the sea of sharks for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Because I was isolated, my maturation period from you know, think about it, I just turned 17 till 37. My life wasn't normal. Mm-hmm. You know, I went from waking up to hell to being in prison to fighting for my life every step of the way. And most people can't fathom what that's like. Most mm-hmm. people think, you know. Did you get a lot of physical altercations in prison? No. Worked out a lot. Um, also, being in the law library. Kept you away from a lot of people. Yeah. Well, it kept me away from a lot of people, but it also kept me friendly with a lot of people. Because they could, needed you. They yeah. needed me, right? You know, listen, were, were, were you uh, were you bartering uh, 
good for law advice? I did. I did. <laughs> I could say I could say it now without reservation, <laughs> without any hesitation. But I always say that I was fair with everyone. <laughs> okay. And that you will never find a person who said I robbed them or I did them dirty. There you go. Well, it won't happen. Okay. Um, I was always used to tell people, listen, you know, I, I remember working one guy's case where I was like, listen. You got like 1% chance of success. I said, but I think I found a loophole. Okay. He's like, just try it. And I won. And he came back and he gave me even more because he's like, listen, he's, you were honest with me. He goes, cool. he goes other people lie to me. Okay. There and and I found working in the law library, that's what it gave me. It gave me an opportunity to help other people, but it also gave me an opportunity to work mm-hmm. on my case as much as possible. When you look back in your life now, do you kind of feel that there was some type of reason this all happened? I'm smiling because I was just asked that exact question about two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I say to them, you know, waking up every day in prison, hell no, not in a million years. But after I became a lawyer, after I worked my, walked my first exoneree out of prison, I was starting to believe that the hell I went through, if the purpose is to make a difference in the system, mm-hmm. make a change, then what I went through, there was a purpose. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I can help save other people's lives, either by making sure that they don't go to prison, by exonerating them, great. Mm -hmm. Because it is very rewarding what I do. I love what I do now. I love when the Innocence Project calls me at the last minute and says, listen, Marty, we need you to testify in Oregon or Ohio about this legislation. Can you do it? Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem. And I've done that twice in the last few months and legislation passed in both states. Nice. You know, to me, having the opportunity to make a a long lasting difference, Mm -hmm. being part of legislation that's going to be on the books for decades to come and to know that I testify and I was part of it, that's rewarding. To be able to inspire some of my students to go on and work at the Innocence Project, which two of them are now working at, to help other exonerees, that's rewarding. So cool. You know, I hear you talk about like the death of your parents. You kind of like breeze by it. Did you ever process it? Did you go to therapy? Did you feel like you had any type of like mourning or deal with it? So in prison, no. I mean, you know, in prison they have therapists, but like didn't really trust anybody. Mm -hmm. And the mourning and the the therapy didn't really happen until I got out of prison. Um, Because when I was being forced to kind of address the murder charges – uh, one of my family said, it's not a time to get emotional. It's a time to get smart because your life is on the line. And that's really kind of what I had to live by. It's what I focused on. Uh, I, I couldn't grieve until I had my life back. Mm-hmm. And that didn't happen until I was free. Wow. Um, and for me, it's not over because the guilty parties are still out there, even though a lot of them are deceased. Mm-hmm. And for me, I want the district attorney of Suffolk County to reopen my case which I know people think you're crazy, Marty, it's over with, but I don't think so. I think it's fair. I think it's just. I mean, the new DA out there has made it a policy and motto that he has no allegiance to the prior regime. Mm -hmm. We know the prior regime was corrupt and dirty. We've proven that. I hope that Tim Sinney will one day, with given the right information that we've developed, since I've gotten out, because we've developed a whole wealth of information Mm -hmm. and evidence and witnesses, that they'll reopen my case. And if anybody's able to be charged, be charged, but at least issue a public report of their findings. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think it's important. I think it's important to re-inform and re-educate people that I didn't get out on a technicality, I didn't get out on some loophole, that I was exonerated because I'm innocent. Mm -hmm. And that there's still a wealth of information out there that people have never seen, they've never read about, that will make people understand what happened to me. Because what happened to me wasn't an accident, and I don't like calling it a wrongful conviction. I think it's an intentional you, conviction. Yeah, it's different. It, it's not like, oh, well, we didn't get this evidence or whatever. It was a, a malicious with intent to disclose and uh, push away evidence that would prove you innocent with motive. In many wrongful conviction cases. And probably bribing that I'm sure is like what you know, takes place. You know, this is going to say, in many wrongful conviction cases, they shouldn't be called wrongful. Yeah. They should be called intentional. Mm-hmm. Because wrongful indicates that a mistake was made, yeah. an error was like made. Like a clerical error. 
But if yeah. you look at a lot of the exonerees, mm-hmm. it wasn't it wasn't accidental. It was they withheld evidence. There was try to destroy evidence. Try to destroy Bruce, evidence. All sorts of things. They had forensic lab people who faked test results. Mm-hmm. You had people who were hiding witnesses away and bribing them. Mm-hmm. Just one thing after another. That's not wrongful conduct. Mm-hmm. That's intentional conduct. Yeah. You know, in my case, you know, during the civil rights proceedings, we found out that at the time of my trial, even before, the medical examiner told the DA's office that the murder weapon that they said was a murder weapon was not the murder weapon, couldn't have been the murder weapon. They never shared that with us. It's crazy. It took us 25 years in a civil rights lawsuit to get that out. Hmm. And that's the other sad thing is in so many of these cases, we don't learn things until years later. And sometimes it's required after a lawsuit, which is which which shouldn't happen. Of course. Well, I appreciate you coming out, man. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. It's it's an honor. I mean, and I hope your listeners, you know, listen, your your listeners can get involved. They can do things. You know, my class at Georgetown. There's a website called makingexonery.com. Our first year, which was filmed entirely, was made into a documentary. So if they go to making the exonery, the film.com, they can <laughs> hear about it. Nice. It's been winning some awards. Um, we're nominated for a lot of things. It's not publicly available yet, mm-hmm. but it's screening. And I think when people see it, they're going to understand the power of humanity and they're going to understand that, you know, undergraduate students can overcome obstacles, even what they go through as students, because they were challenge they were told oh you'll never succeed mm-hmm. you know, you're only an undergraduate you know we may not be able to succeed in every case but i think you know there's a, that old saying about you know if you can save one life you save all humanity I think mm-hmm. it's in the talmud i really believe in that that you know and because i think if we save one life it's really is more than one life because that one person we saved will go on and try to help save somebody else or he'll direct them back to us mm-hmm. Uh, close out with uh, the story. I, uh, I listened to a lot of speakers, and this one speaker who says, um, "You know, there was a bunch of fish that would like get uh, pushed up to to shore, and there was this old man who would be walking, and he'd grab a fish and he'd throw it back into the sea, and he'd grab a fish and he'd throw it back into the sea, he'd just walk up and down the shore doing that. And this young kid was like, "What are you doing, old man? That, that, you know, that one fish doesn't make a difference." And he grabbed the fish and he said, "If this was yo ass, it would make all the difference in the world." That sounds very similar to the story. <laughs> when we're done, I'm going to play you the story. It okay. almost sounds like a, like a somewhat version of it. All right, cool. Well, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you. And hopefully your listeners, if they have any follow-up questions, yeah, they can absolutely. reach out they can to reach us. out to you on uh, Instagram. I'm on uh, my, my, <laughs> my social media is exonerated, X-O-N-E-R-8-E-D. Mm-hmm. It's also the license plate of one of my cars. There you go. Uh, but I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, oh, yeah. LinkedIn. You know, I, and I love doing this. I love educating people. Because really, mm-hmm. this is about educating people. A um, and the way we make a difference is educating people, which really becomes empowering people. Mm-hmm. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This has been part two of our two-part special episode with Marty Tinklev. We look forward to connecting with you again next week for a new episode of Hell as an Exit. See you guys next week. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 888-699-9395 to speak to a specialist. This show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com.